Okay, so now welcome to the uh, third section of this lecture. We have just seen that uh, for Khan process networks uh, we have a uh, modeling technique which is uh, very convenient, uh, it's very powerful, but it's very difficult to, to analyze. In certain cases, uh, we do need models that are easier to analyze. We do need models where it's uh, reasonably easy to find a safe upper bound on the phi force. So therefore, we are now looking at the other extreme end of the modeling capabilities. We are looking at uh, so-called uh, synchronous data flow. A synchronous data flow is uh, computationally much less powerful, but it's much easier to analyze. The term synchronous uh, data flow indicates that uh, we now assume that there is a global clock available which is uh, controlling uh, the firing of nodes. Nevertheless, uh, we are still assuming asynchronous message passing. So in this case, we have this very strange combination of uh, uh, the term synchronous uh, with asynchronous. SDF is both synchronous and asynchronous. It's synchronous because we have this reference to the global clock. It's asynchronous because we have an instance of asynchronous message passing. So don't be confused. I think the problem is that the terms synchronous and asynchronous are used in too many different contexts. So what is uh, synchronous data flow? Well, in syn synchronous data flow, uh, we can explain uh, the uh, operation of such a model. We can explain how we have to execute such a model by again referring to the graphical representation. In this graphical representation, we again have a, a dependency graph. So we have uh, nodes and we have edges. Uh, the nodes in this case are called uh, actors and these edges are labeled with certain weights. Uh, these uh, weights are describing the number of uh, uh, signals, or in this case called uh, tokens, that are consumed whenever we execute the code that uh, corresponds to these nodes. Uh, these nodes are uh, said to be ready. If the necessary number of uh, input tokens or input signals exist, and if enough buffer space at the output also exists. If these uh, actors are ready, they can fire and uh, their firing is uh, uh, linked to the global clock. Uh, so whenever we have a clock uh, signal and when these nodes are ready, they are assumed to fire. Um, so what will happen in, in this case is uh, the uh, following. We can have a clock and then on a particular clock tick uh, we will fire uh, these uh, uh, actors and on the next clock tick we can again fire these actors and on the next clock tick we can again uh, fire these actors and on another clock tick we can fire uh, these actors. Uh, we know, in contrast to uh, uh, Khan process networks, that the execution of the code linked uh, to these actors will uh, take some time. Now actually the example that I demonstrated is a, a special case of a synchronous data flow. Uh, it is the special case of so-called homogeneous synchronous data flow. It's homogeneous because all uh, these edges are labeled with the same weight, which means that the number of tokens that are consumed per firing is uh, always the same. Now, in the more general case, we might have numbers uh, different from, from one on these edges. And that means in the more general case, we might be consuming or producing a number of uh, tokens that's, that's different from one. So in this more general case, uh, we are seeing uh, an example for, for this more general case in this situation. In this situation, A is uh, ready and can fire because there are enough tokens on uh, the incoming edges and there is enough capacity on the outgoing edge. So as a result of uh, A firing, we are coming to a situation where we have uh, three tokens here in uh, this uh, FIFO at the output of A. Now as a result, uh, B is ready and can fire, so therefore we can now execute B. 
uh, after the execution of B, we have removed two tokens there from the FIFO. And uh, now A is again ready and can fire, whereas uh, B is not. So as a result, uh, uh, we uh, are uh, generating more tokens here in the FIFO. And now again, B is ready and can uh, fire. And uh, after uh, having an execution of B, we will be coming to that situation where again, it's where again, it's a situation uh, where uh, 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 where only B can can execute. Now after one execution uh, uh, we are coming back to the initial situation. After one execution of, of B uh, we are coming back to the situation in which uh, uh, this uh, buffer is empty and now A is uh, ready and could fire. So uh, we are having a, a situation where a complete uh, period has, has been uh, executed. Now in the model described uh, so far uh, we were having these uh, uh, FIFO buffers explicitly indicated for the edges. Having this as an additional element in, in the modeling uh, is actually somewhat inconvenient and we would like uh, to uh, constrain ourselves, uh, we would like to constrain ourselves to use just uh, these nodes, these edges and these weights. So therefore, it makes sense uh, to uh, exploit the fact that we can model a limited capacity uh, of the FIFO buffers by introducing backward edges. So if we introduce this backward edge over here, and if we introduce a certain initial number of tokens for the backward edge, uh, then this is the equivalent of, uh, the, of a buffer capacity that corresponds to the number of tokens that we have here on, on the edge. So that's what's done in practice. In practice, we are using these backward edges instead of explicit FIFOs. Now from the example, it was already obvious that the uh, firing rate uh, depends on the number of tokens. We have seen this for uh, these uh, two nodes. Uh, there was a case where actually we had to execute uh, B three times and uh, A uh, two times uh, in order to come back to the initial situation of an empty FIFO. Now that can be generalized in the following way. If uh, we have uh, some uh, producer that's executing with uh, a certain rate and for each execution produces a certain number of tokens and if we have a consumer that's executing at a certain rate and for each execution uh, is uh, consuming a certain number of tokens uh, then we need to maintain uh, this kind of invariant, this kind of uh, Kirchhoff equation uh, in order not to accumulate tokens here in the FIFO uh, we ne need to have uh, this, uh, this invariant. So the total number of tokens consumed must be the total number of tokens pr uh, produced. Now with uh, uh, SDF, number of things are considerably easier than with Khan process networks. First of all, it's uh, decidable whether our uh, buffer will be of sufficient size and also uh, we can figure out whether or not a deadlock is possible for an SDF model. Also, we can statically generate uh, schedules. Now, the fact that we can uh, statically generate schedules is uh, very convenient in a situation where uh, we are having multi-cores available as execution platforms. We can think of having initially some SDF model and then from this SDF model we can generate one implementation that's a sequential implementation and we can ha have another implementation which is a parallel implementation and all uh, can be derived from the same specification. So that's obviously much more convenient than to manually uh, parallelize applications. This also clearly indicates that whenever a certain actor is ready to execute, it doesn't necessarily have to execute. It will actually depend on the implementation whether it will really uh, execute immediately. 
with respect to the uh, expressiveness of uh, uh, synchronous data flow, uh, we have to state that synchronous data flow is uh, much less computationally powerful. In order to be a Turing complete, we would need something like the full power of a programming language. We would at, ne at least need something like a conditional test and uh, increment instruction. Uh, but for these SDF models, we only have simple arithmetic operations available uh, for these operators. So therefore, as a result, uh, SDF is not uh, Turing complete and uh, obviously its restriction, the so-called homogeneous synchronous data flow, is also not uh, Turing complete. There is an extension, the so-called cyclostatic data flow, uh, where at any particular time these rates are fixed, but they can uh, vary and the transition between the different rates can be controlled by a associated finite state machine. Such a model is again not Turing complete. But then in contrast we have uh, KPNs as a, a Turing complete model. In this diagram, certain languages uh, that I did not uh, discuss uh, are indicated with the uh, dashed uh, lines. Uh, these languages are uh, listed in uh, the source from which I took this diagram, uh, that is uh, the thesis of Sandestoik. This is a uh, somewhat uh, similar representation where we see that for homogeneous synchronous data flow we have excellent analyzability uh, and uh, for Khan process networks uh, analyzability is very much limited but with uh, uh, respect to uh, uh, expressiveness this is just the other way around. Now these uh, data flow based uh, languages are very popular and there is a number of uh, commercial tools available that uses uh, these uh, types of uh, languages. So for example there is Simulink. Simulink is a toolbox uh, which is available as an option for MATLAB and in Simulink it's possible to use uh, different uh, boxes and uh, the designers assume that data is flowing through these boxes. These boxes look very much like analog components and designers usually think of uh, using them like analog components. However, it's uh, not that easy because uh, Simulink models are simulated on a digital computer uh, where we use uh, time steps to approximate the behavior of analog components. So therefore, as a result, the semantics is not really that uh, uh, easy to define uh, because the step size of the simulation really has an impact on the uh, precision with which we are approximating these analog components and therefore the precise semantics of uh, Simulink uh, is uh, not very easy to define. There are uh, also uh, possibilities for turning these models into executable code, code that can be generated on some microcontroller for example. In combination with Simulink we can use the so-called uh, real-time workshop. The real-time workshop is a toolbox that allows you to generate uh, code uh, that's uh, designed for some microcontroller. For example, we could generate uh, code for a simple model just like that one uh, where we have a little switch which is uh, controlled by one of its input and then for such a model uh, code like the one shown down here could be generated uh, we are running the code in a loop and for each iteration of the loop we are uh, testing the control input and then depending on the value at the control input we are reading in from one of the channels or reading from the other channel and uh, then we are forwarding this information to the output. So this code can be generated automatically and uh, we don't uh, uh, have uh, to care about too many details if uh, we do generate the code in that way. There are also other tools that uh, are based on the same idea, uh, like uh, LabVIEW for example. LabVIEW is uh, a tool that uh, the students of our course will be using for uh, programming their uh, LEGO Mindstorm robots. And again, uh, we are modeling uh, the uh, uh, communication between these different boxes in a, a data flow based manner. Coming towards the end of this uh, presentation, 
uh, I'd like to point out uh, a key uh, difference between the type of modeling that we're using here and the standard modeling as it is used uh, in uh, software technology. Uh, and in this case, I'm using a slide that was presented by Edward Lee. Uh, he points out that uh, standard software technology is uh, talking about this object orientation as a paradigm for programming. And that means from some caller you're calling a certain method that belongs to a certain class and that method will then execute some code and after some time uh, you're returning to the caller. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a modeling may be actor oriented in uh, that situation. Uh, you are assuming that uh, the operations are somehow uh, sitting there and waiting for input data. If that input data arrives, uh, processing uh, can start and after the output has been generated, uh, the output is forwarded to some other actor that may be waiting for that input. So that's the key difference between a standard modeling that's used in software technology and the one that is more appropriate for embedded systems. Now this leads me to the uh, conclusion of this uh, set of slides. Uh, for this uh, set of slides, we were uh, discussing uh, the data flow uh, model of computation. Initially, I motivated the use of data flow. I tried to define the term data flow, and then we looked at Khan process networks. We saw that they are computationally very powerful, but uh, somehow difficult to analyze. Uh, but the fact that they are determinate really is a key advantage when we use them in a design process. And then I introduced uh, synchronous uh, data flow and its uh, variants um, as a modeling paradigm at the other end of the spectrum where we have much more restricted uh, capabilities of the different uh, uh, components there in the model. But on the other hand, uh, having these restrictions gives us uh, an improved analyzability. And finally, I demonstrated that a couple of visual programming languages are uh, based on the data flow modeling paradigm, in particular Simulink, uh, the real-time workshop, and uh, LabVIEW are based on uh, data flow modeling. This concludes uh, today's lecture. Thank you very much.